All right, good morning to everyone. Happy Thanksgiving, and welcome to our service here at Faith Baptist Church. I'm Borden Scott, and uh, today we're going to be continuing our focus on restoration and recovery as we talk about recovering spirituality, whatever it is that that means. But so we also are going to count our blessings today. We're going to give thanks for all that we have, for all that we look forward to, thanks to Jesus, for all that God has seen us through as well. So I want to begin with a moment of prayer. And, uh, we'll, and we'll spend uh, this time together in a, a spirit of gratitude and thanksgiving. So let's, uh, let's pray together. Loving God, your word says to us, shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. And give thanks to him and praise his name, for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. As we prepare ourselves to give this time and attention to you in worship, Lord God, may we echo this song. Holy Spirit, help us to overcome anything that stands between us and better knowing our God. Following Jesus Christ and giving thanks to him today. Amen. Well, uh, spirit of Thanksgiving, we managed to cajole a few people into uh, make, taking part in our little uh, Thanksgiving video for this week. So we're going to pop the stage lights down and, uh, and pull that up for you here before our worship team comes and leads us in some singing. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I am thankful for family, friends. Uh, I'm thankful for uh, the people we have in charge of our health care, believe it or not. I feel that they are doing a reasonably good job. I'm thankful for this congregation and just everything. <laughs> I'm thankful for health and life. I'm thankful for my home. Your home, good answer, okay. And my food. Say more time. And my food. And your food, good one, all right. What am I thankful for this Thanksgiving? I would have to say my faith, because when I look back on life, I can't imagine what that would look like had I not grown up with my faith. Well, we are all very thankful for the fact that in a few days from now we are coming up on the first anniversary of our new neighborhood, so we're thankful for our home and our neighbors and the community, the faith community that we've joined since we're coming here. What are you thankful for, Corey? I don't know. Okay. Good morning. I'm thankful that God doesn't uh, give me what I deserve. His grace is new every day, and uh, it's the, pretty much the only thing that sustains me in the days of COVID, that and my beautiful family. I'm thankful for God. Hi, I'm thankful for music, but also I'm thankful for sports. Okay. Uh, I'm thankful for relationships, um, old ones that are supportive and new ones that are just developing. One, two, three, go. No, it's not gonna happen. One, two, three. I'm thankful for my friend Jamie helping me learn how to ride my bike with no training wheels. I am thankful that God doesn't forget about us even if we're not paying the right attention to him. I'm thankful for uh, the people who stick with us even when things are, are crazy and make sure that they wanna add into our lives. And I'm thankful for this place that I get to keep serving and being challenged in new and interesting ways. Okay, go ahead. I'm thankful that I live somewhere where uh, you can see the seasons changing. What are you thankful for, Beth? I'm thankful for food. You're thankful for food? Okay, fantastic. Anytime. Hi, everybody. I'm thankful for uh, my community, my family, uh, especially my church and everybody here. And uh, happy Thanksgiving, everybody. What are you thankful for, Corey? I don't know. <laughs> One, two, three. I'm thankful for my new grandson, Elliot. And I'm also thankful for uh, 
my husband who planted a beautiful garden and we've been enjoying fresh vegetables all summer. One, two, three. I'm thankful for my family. Go ahead. I'm thankful that my son Matthew and his wife Anna have taken Mary and I in as we have sold our house, so thank you. I'm thankful that our church is a place we can get together and have fun, do some interesting activities, and I'm thankful for all of you who were willing to be in this video. I am so thankful for our church family and for the many blessings and everything. I'm just very, very thankful for the love of our Savior. Amen. said in that that he was thankful for music and uh, sports. He's not with us today, not for either of those reasons, um, but because he was called away for another thing. So we'll be uh, with you this morning. We're going to be singing by, beginning by singing forever. God, our Lord and King, His love endures forever. He is good above all things, His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise. With a mighty hand and a stretched arm, His love endures forever. That's been reborn, his love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise. Forever God is faithful, forever God is strong, forever God is with us forever, forever. From the rising to the setting sun, His love endures forever. And by the grace of God, we will carry on. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise. Forever God is faithful, forever God is strong, forever God is with us forever.
seated. Our call to worship this morning is from the second chapter of the book of Colossians. We'll be getting to read at verse 6. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. In verse 13. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave, forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing, triumphing over them by the cross. God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. You're rich in love and you're slow to anger. Your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness I will keep on seeing. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. And on that day when my strength is failing, draws near and my time has come still my soul will sing your praise unending ten thousand years and then forevermore bless the Lord oh my soul oh my soul worship his holy name sing like this
All right, a couple of announcements, and then we have a children's story video from, from Erica, and uh, then we'll have the kids dismissed. So I just want to update you on a couple of things. We sent a big update through email and put it on our website for the Phase 5 thing, so I won't spend a lot of time there, but you'll notice that unless you ask otherwise, we're seating people a little closer together with just the two seats. Um, most things stay the same for us at the moment, but... Um, the big note that we put in there was that uh, the provincial rules are now that the proof of vaccination, we don't need it for what we're doing right now on Sunday morning worship. We do need it for everything else that we might do as a church, unless it's hosted in people's homes. So that's something just to keep in mind. Uh, the next thing will be our uh, event next Sunday, which we're going to talk more about in a second. Uh, and then down the road, things like business meetings or Bible studies or other groups that happen at the church. Those are all, we're all going to be required to check proof of vaccination for all of those things. The one thing we have done above and beyond what's asked is that our, our church council has asked those who volunteer in certain areas to also provide their proof of vaccine. So that means our, our children's ministry workers in particular, our, our worship team and me and anyone else who stands up here and speaks uh, to you without their mask, uh, as well as our, our leadership teams themselves as an example. So our deacons and our council are all going to be doing that by, uh, we've asked everyone to submit that by next week and to give that to uh, Allison or see Allison and make arrangements to uh, uh, make sure that she knows that you have your, your proof of vaccine so she can update our database. So that's, that's what we're doing both to respect the provincial rules and to just do what we can to make sure people are feeling safe and uh, just reassured that we're doing what we can uh, for them. Last week, we talked about restoring community and uh, so I've got two things about that. One is a, a note that went out, but uh, one opportunity for that um, is the men's coffee time on Friday, which we wanted to make sure you knew about. And there's been a change, so it's good to announce it this week. Um, because of the proof of vaccine rules, their old meeting place isn't going to work. So they're meeting at Futures Cafe on 61 Glendale Avenue on Friday mornings, somewhere around 1030 until somewhere around noon. It's not a super strict thing. And uh, you'll also need proof of vaccine to go there. And, uh, and so you're welcome anytime uh, at all to, to come and just uh, spend a little time with them. The announcement says, be there or be square. So, okay. <laughs> we also talked about in my sermon last week a little bit about things that we could do as a church family to be community builders. And I uh, got Allison to put those on a little card for you. And that's something that you could take home and you could put on a fridge or a place that you'd see it once in a while. And those are on the table. And I encourage you to take one of those on the way out, just as something that might catch your eye and remember that, yeah, I could, I could make a big difference in my church by being a community builder, by, you know, once a month doing, you know, giving this invitation to a meal or to, to coffee or an activity, you know, maybe twice an act of, of service, three times an introduction or a conversation to learn a little more about someone. Uh, you know, four times a month, maybe a, a phone call, a text, a, a message online to someone, just to check in with them. Focusing that on people who are not in my normal circle, the people I wouldn't normally already do that for as a way of expanding community. So this, this could just be a good reminder. It's not a strict thing, but it's an opportunity to say, oh, I'll put that on there and I'll, I'll do what I can as we look at how we restore community when more opportunities start to present themselves in the weeks and months to come. Uh, Thanksgiving. So we, uh, this is Thanksgiving. We've got some extra food items that you've brought for Beacon House, but you, at any point we've got our Beacon House box and you can contribute other weeks to that, bringing non-perishable food items for them. Uh, the other thing is we're, we are taking a Thanksgiving offering. We didn't do big letters this year, uh, but there are special envelopes available on the table. You can check off Thanksgiving or if you're e-transferring, you can put a note on there. And so if you're feeling thankful and you have the means and opportunity, uh, that Thanksgiving offering this year is going to go to upgrading our, our soundboard, which uh, is somewhere between England and here right now, hopefully, and uh, <laughs> coming to help us uh, get a few more of our technological things working uh, as best they can. So that's where our Thanksgiving offering will go if you'd like to contribute to that this year. So next Sunday, we've got a special thing happening. We're going to have a, a slightly different service because we're going to finish our recovering series with recovering joy. Uh, and it's going to be an intergenerational service. There's no Sunday school, and we're going to have the, the kids here with us, and we're going to have a lot of different uh, fun things happening with our, our music. There's going to be some skits. There's going to be some laughter. There's going to be uh, some things to get us excited about our after church event. And uh, so first of all, in the spirit of that, uh, we showed you the promotional video we made about the October 17th event. Uh, now we're going to show you the stuff that didn't make it in. Uh, so we'll pull that uh, down, and Lucy will, will play that for us in a second here.
<laughs> Good job. No, 17. <laughs> and are we pondering or are we looking at the camera? <laughs> oh I'm holding it to your, your interpretation of the role. Okay. Okay, you, does it look like I'm doing it? Totally. I'm already rolling. <laughs> Get your head down. Yeah. <laughs> okay, one, two, three. Come join us on October 17th. Joe, I'm feeling a little sad that summer's over. You know what, Amy? Me too. Yeah, it was a great summer, but now what do we even have to look forward to? I don't even know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> October 17th. Yeah, or you know what, Dabney? You could just say, come join us on October, and then stop, and Ella will say 17th. Okay, you can do it. I believe in you. <laughs> no, I can't. do you do this thing? No! Honey. Okay, do you want to start from the top? And see. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, I don't want to have to cut this nine times. <laughs> you obviously have to start from the top. <laughs> We got to have a good lesson at home about uh, kind of watching some of those three with the, with the kids and, you know, not being sure if that was funny or, or not and to, for, for Dabney in particular and uh, get, having her learn that, you know what, we, we want to take God very seriously at church and ourselves not too seriously at all. <laughs> and so it's, uh, it's not, not a bad thing when we, when we goof and uh, other people can enjoy it. So here's a little more about October 17th in case you got distracted about what the date is. It's the 17th. The date is October 17th which is next Sunday, thank you very much. Uh, so it is next Sunday, we're gearing up, we're pretty excited. I wanna leave you with three things to remember. Item one, we still have some invitations, paper invitations, there's some on the table on your way out. We really encourage you if you've got uh, family or neighbors or someone who would enjoy um, checking out church and seeing what it's like, give them a piece of paper that says you're welcome to join us. It's not an intense thing to do uh, and people, will be excited to be invited. We also have it set up as a Facebook event. So if you're not going to see the person that you'd like to invite in person, you can also invite them to it. If inviting someone to a Facebook event is a complicated task, you can call me and I will help you. But um, we absolutely want to get the word out and encourage other people to come. Um, this is not one of the three things, this is a side note. If you are coming and you are on Facebook, can you click going to this event? Because the more people that are going, the more Facebook lets other people know about it. It's like the, we're not going to pay money to Facebook to help us, but if you guys all say yes, I'm going, then Facebook will acknowledge that by sending it to more people. So let's get some invitations out. Uh, on the day of, we are very excited to have as much help as we can get. So we'll be here for 9 a.m. for setup, and we would love to have any help uh, that you are willing to give. And then we are also staying after the event, I would say around 1.30, 2 o'clock for cleanup. Um, so it's a great way to support this event. And I will have lots of jobs for people, so don't worry about that. If you come and you want to help out, uh, just come find me. We'll get you put to work. Uh, and the third thing I wanted to mention is that if you are not a person in a phase of life with small children, we would still love to have you stay. So there's going to be tons of food, tons of fun. Uh, we're hoping for good weather. We're going to have it out back, so bring a sweater. Uh, you can sit at a picnic table and just enjoy observing the chaos, uh, if that's the speed of life you're at. Uh, but please plan to stay. We would love to have as many uh, friendly faces there as possible. If it's an outdoor event, we don't have to wear masks. If it's an outdoor event, we don't have to wear masks. Um, so you'll be able to sit comfortably, or obviously you're welcome to wear masks still. Uh, lots of fun and games, and lots of opportunities to kind of get to know some people and reconnect with some of our community. So if you have any questions, or if you need any other info, come see me, I'll be around after service. And if not, I look forward to seeing some of you at 9 a.m. and the rest of you at 10.30 next week. Thank you. All right, everyone go. All right, so we've got the children's story coming up next. This is a video heavy Sunday. I didn't know how that was gonna happen, but our, our, uh, Eric, our mentored ministry student from Acadia Divinity College, she's not with us most weeks through the fall because she's living up there and traveling back and forth, but I still give her jobs, and one of those jobs this week is uh, to talk about Thanksgiving a little bit. So this will be uh, for that children's story, and then after the video's done, kids are welcome to head out with their Sunday school teachers for Sunday school.
Good morning, Faith Baptist Church and FBC Kids. I wish that I could be there in person with all of you today, but we will have to settle with this virtual version of myself. Now, do you guys know what is so special about this Sunday? It's Thanksgiving. Now, what do you guys like to do for Thanksgiving? Maybe it's something that, or some things that I like to do on Thanksgiving. I like to put up some decorations, eat lots of really good food, maybe a little bit too much food. I like to spend a lot of time with my family, maybe play a really intense game of Monopoly or Dutch Blitz. But Thanksgiving, it's more than just eating a lot of turkey. It's about being thankful. It's a day where we can give thanks to God. Now, we can thank God every other day, but today we want to especially take some time and remember all the things in life that we're really thankful for, all the good things that God has done for us. And you know, the Bible, it talks a lot about why it's important to be thankful. God wants us to live with joy and to be content for the things that we have in our lives. And this also keeps us from wanting things that we don't have or maybe things that we don't need. And we want to appreciate the blessings that he's given us. So what are some things that you're thankful for? Here's a list of some of the things that I'm thankful for and maybe later you can break down some of the things that you're thankful for. I'm thankful for the house that I live in, the food that I have in my kitchen, the clothes in my closet. I'm also thankful for all my teachers who teach me so many great things. I'm thankful for my friends and my family who are always there for me when I need them. And I'm thankful for God who provides all things for us and gives us so much love. Now, I'm gonna give you a passage from the Bible that maybe you can take some time later to memorize. And it comes from 1 Thessalonians 5.18, which is a letter that Paul wrote. And it says, give thanks in all circumstances for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now, when Paul says give thanks in all circumstances, this means that we should thank God when things are really good, but also when things aren't so good. And you might be thinking, how can we give thanks to God when things are bad? So let's look at a few examples. Now, what if you're on a soccer team or a baseball team or any other sports team and your team won, what could you thank God for? You could give him thanks for winning the game. But what if your team lost? What could you thank God for then? Well, you could thank him for being able to play a game with your friends and having a lot of fun together. Let's look at a second example. What if it's a beautiful sunny day outside what could we thank God for then? Well, we could thank him for the nice weather, all the fun things that we get to do outside in the sun. But what if it's rainy all day, and super cloudy and gross? What could we thank God for then? Well, we could thank him for the rain that helps plants grow. We could thank him for the puddles that we get to jump in or the opportunity to sit inside and have a nice movie day all cuddled up on the couch. So whether things are good or bad, we can always find something to thank God for. Let's take a minute to pray together. Dear God, there are so many things that we are thankful for. We thank you for being a good God. You are so good no matter what happens. We can always thank you for something. Help us to see the good in every situation so that we can always give you thanks. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, Sunday school time. So those who are heading out can make their way over to the, the gym and meet up with their teachers. I'm thankful for all the, all the noises of babies and little kids we get to <laughs> hear while we're here. A good sign that that is and an encouragement. 
Let's uh, come together in uh, our congregational prayer. Let's pray. Loving God, today I give you thanks on behalf of a grateful people. Some are thankful for good circumstances today and are enjoying health and stability and family. Others are struggling against illness or grieving loss or unsure of what the future will hold for them. But all of us who know and worship you can be thankful for what you have done and given to us. We thank you for the sun that rose over this world today, for the breath in our lungs as we rose to start the day, and for the people we encountered along the way. We thank you for the fall leaves and the blue sky and the beauty of your creation. We thank you for the love of family and friends and church community that we are able to give and receive. And we thank you that this present world is not all that we have to look forward to. Lord Jesus, you gave your life and you were raised to life again as proof of your promise of redemption and eternal life. Your final victory over sin and death is coming leaving nothing but peace and life and joy in the perfect presence of our Creator. Help us to live as people who believe your word and your promises, whatever our circumstances. Make us, in our gratitude to you, a refreshing presence in an anxious world. Guard us against the lies of our adversary that, and ground us in your unshakable and unbreakable love that we might be the salt and the light in this world that you ask us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn things back to our, our worship leaders for our hymn of trust. I'm thankful for, uh, for people like Amy that can do Facebook things and help with, with that kind of thing. However, Amy, if we're ever in a canoe together, I'm doing the paddling. <laughs> To God be the glory. To God be the glory, great things he hath done, so loved he the world that he gave us his son. It is life an atonement for sin and open the life gate that all may go in praise the lord praise the lord let the earth hear his voice praise the lord praise the lord let the people rejoice oh come to the father through jesus the son and give him the Redemption, the purchase of blood to every believer, the promise of God, the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Great things he hath taught us, great things he hath done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son. But and greater will be our wonder, our transport when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and
Well, this morning's scripture reading is most of Psalm 42, uh, Psalm 42, 1 through 8. It'll be on the screen, but if you want a moment to, to pull that up in your own uh, Bible or device on your, or Bible on your device, then uh, you can have a moment for that. From God's word we read, As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me all day long, Where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. Why, O oh my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. My soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, from the heights of, of Hermon, from, from Mount Mazar. Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. By day, the Lord directs his love. At night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. God bless to our understanding this reading from his word. This was one of those messages that about 10.30 last night, I decided it needed to be completely restructured. So let's just pray for a moment that God knows what he's doing with that. Lord God, I simply pray for more of you and less of me, and that you would be in the heart of each one who hears through your Holy Spirit, doing what you desire to do through this, through this offering of the receptive hearts out there and the, the best that my mind and fingers could bring to, uh, to what is here. Bless us, I pray, in your name, amen. So we're nearing the end of a series about restoration and recovery. These are things that God is known for doing in the Bible and in the lives of many people who trust in him. And God makes a way to recover from setbacks, to rebuild what's been destroyed, to restore hope where it's faded, and even to return the dead to life. And I believe this theme can be helpful to us as we are in this period of transition. And we are sort of in this fourth wave, but it's not really a wave. Our vaccination rates are pretty good, and we hope at least that we're about to see the worst of this pandemic behind us. But even if that's true, these past 18 months, they have affected us. And so to move forward in a healthy and helpful and hopeful way, we need to grapple with what we have come through and ask God for a vision of what should come next as we adjust our lives and our church to this thing called the new normal. And so far, we've explored recovering grace and hope and service and community, and today we'll be restoring spirituality. But first, I think it'd be helpful to know what that even means for Christians, and then we'll dig more into Psalm 42 with its timely themes, its examples of spirituality that could help us decide how it is that we will want to fill our hearts in the weeks and months to come. So to start, what is spirituality? Right, that's, that's actually a serious question. Like if, if you, someone you knew came up to you and you said, hey, you go to church, right? So can you tell me what spirituality is? And what, what answer would you have for that? You know, maybe it would be, hang on, hang on, I'll Google that for you. Just, uh, just give me a second. To many people, spirituality has to do with being connected to something greater than themselves, something that is beyond the material world, or maybe it's related to our deepest values, our quest for meaning, in life, that's maybe become a common usage. But in the Christian tradition, spirituality was initially understood as a process of restoration. It's recovering the original shape of humanity. Or put another way, Christian spirituality is about reforming ourselves into the people we were created to be with the help of the Holy Spirit. And spirituality is not optional. It's not a hobby that some people pursue. You know, uh, the Catholic uh, and Canadian priest Ronald Rollheiser wrote a book about Christian spirituality where he writes that everyone has to have a spirituality and everyone does have one 
either a life-giving one or a destructive one. So what shapes our actions is our spirituality. Each action is built on some spiritual desire within us. And that will either cause us to become more whole or less whole. The way we act out those desires also strengthens or weakens our relationship with other people and with God. But we still really have not hit a definition that I think anyone will remember yet. So I, this passage kind of came to my mind as I was trying to come up with something that worked that I would be able to latch on to and others might. And I came to Luke 6, 43 to 45, where Jesus is teaching and he says, a man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. The mouth speaks what the heart is full of. And I think there's a definition of spirituality in this. Our spirituality is the way we fill our hearts. It's all the things we do and we believe and the ways we think and the relationships we have that fill our hearts with with good or with evil. How you fill your heart determines what comes out of you, what you speak as well as how you act and how you love others or don't. And this means, as I talked about in a money series a while back, that everything is spiritual. You're always filling your heart. Going to church and reading your Bible, that's spiritual. Spending money, voting, surfing the internet, that is spiritual too. See, you'll hear people sometimes talk about having a spiritual experience. And that usually means they had some you know, strong emotional response to something, maybe to worship, or a deep realization of some truth for their life, or giving or receiving, or I guess receiving some clear guidance from God about something. And those moments, I think, are precious and powerful. I believe I've had a handful of those in my life, some of which helped me move onto the path I, I am in ministry, others that re- injected the right thought into my mind at the right time. But I've been even more fortunate to get to hear the stories of others who have much more interesting uh, moments than, than I've ever had in my life. But those experiences, even though they're very memorable, are brief. The ordinary moments of life are where most of our heart filling happens. The, the weekly phone call with your friend, the visit to your mom or your dad, the, that rushed bedtime story with your child, the, the thoughts that are running through your head while you're stuck in traffic, or the moments of you know, feeling stressed out at work. It's the low moments, too. It's the times of struggle and despair which are spiritual, which are very formative. Because there are these unhelpful versions of Christianity that are basically just trying to use God like a drug to feel better. Right? Oh, I'm having a rough time. I really just need some Jesus to fix everything. But some circumstances and struggles don't get fixed, no matter how hard we pray or how much we hope. Sometimes our spirituality is how we handle the adversity and endure the struggle. And in all of these times and situations, our hearts are being filled. And we're either cooperating with the Holy Spirit, who helps us become who we were created to be, or we're being shaped and we're being influenced by other things, which may leave us malformed and unprepared to manage life in a healthy way. And one other note about Christian spirituality, which is that it is both personal and corporate. You know, now, not corporate like we're sponsored by Coca-Cola, but corporate as in it's a thing we do together. This is why the church exists. Christian faith and Christian spirituality are not solitary experiences or activities. And so there are important and heart-filling things that we do personally when we pray or study scripture, or study other helpful subjects, or have solitude, or have time appreciating creation, or many of the other spiritual disciplines which have been found valuable by Christians through the centuries. But there are also aspects of our spirituality that require community. Part of that heart-filling that we're called to do involves working and sacrificing alongside others, giving and receiving grace and forgiveness by being close to the flawed people around us, sharing joy and laughter with others, learning from each other's experiences and whatever wisdom it is that we've managed to accumulate through our lives, often through the mistakes that we have made. So keep the importance of corporate spirituality in mind as we work through Psalm 42, which I want to do now. Now, there are some Psalms in the Bible that speak to a particular event in the Old Testament that we can identify, and this is not one of them. And this is one of the psalms written not by King David, but by the psalmist called the sons of Korah. And these are people who were descended from a man who actually rebelled against Moses and was swallowed up by the earth as God's judgment against him in Numbers 16. 
So it's kind of an interesting name to use, but some of his descendants lived much more faithfully than he did. And they produced some of the songs that became part of this book of Psalms. And Psalm 42 and 43, are, they go together. They tell us about the trials and the yearnings of a person who desires God, but who is facing these external and internal struggles. And the external part comes from the people around him, unfaithful people who are taunting him and oppressing him. He says, why must I go about mourning, oppressed by my enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, where is your God? And then in Psalm 43, he adds, Vindicate me, my God, and plead my cause against an unfaithful nation. Rescue me from those who are deceitful and wicked. So he feels alone in trying to be faithful to God, mocked and abused by people who have no regard for God and have contempt for him. He wishes God had more to say about that, that God would do more about that. And I don't know if you can identify with any of that, but I know that it's, it's been disorienting for many Christians, especially if you grew up at a time when church was normal and it was more widely seen as good and trustworthy. And it's disorienting that this is often not the case anymore. Many see the church as an adversary of good, of justice, of mercy. Sometimes it's because we live with different values from the culture we find ourselves in. A culture that sometimes does what the prophet Isaiah said is calling good evil and evil good. And that that can be hard in and of itself when there is that pressure, when we're looked down on and, uh, and treated as the enemy. But for me, it's actually not as hard as the ways the church has earned a bad reputation by failing to live up to the example of Jesus and the teaching of Scripture. That hits me harder when the world can say, where is your God? Right? Where was your God when children starved and died and were abused in residential schools? Where is your God? when abuse goes unchecked and unrepented of in churches? Where is your God when Christians refuse to confront racial or sexual uh, injustice, when they are the source of hate? Where is your God? And it may not be fair to judge Christians based on the actions of a misguided few or things that happened a, a really long time ago in some cases, although that's more debatable to me, but it doesn't really matter if it's fair. It becomes the common impression that people have of us. And so, please, please do not forget that people are paying attention to your words and to your actions in both the real and the online worlds. Because if you profess faith in Jesus, you are never just you. You are always representing him too. Then I go back to the psalmist. He's now also got internal struggles. Some of them might be related to the oppression he's feeling from the world, but I think there's something else going on within him as well. He wants more of God, but he isn't sure where to find that presence and that help. Why, oh my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? This is a refrain through this and the following psalm. And in Psalm 43, he adds, You are God, my stronghold. Why have you rejected me? Send me your light and your faithful care and let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy mountain, to the place where you dwell. Again, the words of someone who is feeling alone cut off from God and the faithful people who would encourage him. He's relying on the memories of when he was able to go and to worship and to have his soul satisfied by that. He says, these things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. And then in Psalm 43, he adds to this, he says, send me your light and your faithful care and let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy mountain, to the place where you dwell. And then I will go to the altar of God, to my God, my joy and my delight, and I will praise you with the lyre. Have you ever been there, right? Where you just wish that you could recover a feeling of worshipfulness or of closeness with God that you had at some other point in your life, but you don't have right now. Why can't I have that again, God? Where did you go? And like the psalmist, we've recently been through periods where we could not come into the house of God and offer praise or participate in some of the other spiritual practices. Our corporate spirituality has certainly been hindered by the pandemic. And having gone through that, 
I'm struck and I am challenged by the passion that the psalmist has to worship. How strong his desire is to be among faithful people and joyfully praising his God. And gathered worship and, and music was a big part of how he sought to fill his heart in the midst of all these internal and external struggles that he was facing. And I don't know about you, but I definitely took for granted the freedom that I had to come to church, to attend a worship service without thinking twice, right? No video recordings, no live streams, no masks, no keeping our distance. And maybe part of restoring our spirituality is learning to think of gathering to worship more like the psalmist does, as a thirst. Right? My soul pants for you, my God. There is this spiritual need as, that I have as I walk through this world, and only you can satisfy it. There's no substitute for coming among your people to praise your name. So there is a danger where people just give up on desiring God when we stop participating for a time, or when well, we still show up, but we just, we just don't really feel it. And all of a sudden, church easily becomes then a product, and we judge it by how well it meets our preferences as religious consumers. We can't allow our gathering to become a dead thing. We can't stop wanting and expecting and pleading even with God to, show, to allow us to come into His presence in some new and powerful way. And we will not get that all the time. At least I don't know anybody who gets that all the time. But we should not settle for never sensing the beautiful and powerful presence of God when we pour out our hearts in praise. See, we did our best when we couldn't gather, but nothing takes the place of this. What would it look like to bring a similar passion, right? To show up to worship with a thirst for God. It's not just the thing I have to do today. It's not just the you know, the place I need to get the kids on time, but it's a place where I show up with a thirst for God, not as a consumer of religious ceremony, but a disciple who is desperate to praise the God who means everything. Now, one of the things I appreciate about the Psalms is that they show us that God can handle our honesty and our complaints, even our accusations against Him when we find ourselves despairing or when we just want to need to reach out. And the psalmist does a lot of that here. But despite his distress, we also can be encouraged that he has not given up. He has not turned away from God. His soul is downcast, and so he pleads for God to lift him up, to bring him into God's presence where he can be refreshed and restored. And he trusts. And he's hurting, but he remembers God's goodness and what it feels like to be in the presence of God. And he trusts that God is still out there. He's still at work. He's still mindful of him. He says, these things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. So why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my God and my Savior. Or again, he says, why my soul is, my, or my soul is downcast within me, therefore I will remember you. Deep calls to deep, the roar of your waterfalls, all your waves and breakers have swept over me. But by day the Lord directs his love, and at night his song is with me. A prayer to the God of my life. Put your hope in God, he says, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. So why wasn't he crushed under the weight of the external pressure, of the internal misery he was experiencing? And I think it has so much to do with how he filled his heart, with his spirituality. Because that's what we draw on, especially in harder times. So we don't know a great deal about the psalmist, but we know of his passion for gathered worship, his desire to praise God through music. We know his trust in God's love for him. We know his hope that God would lift him up the way he had in the past. And we see his willingness to reach out to God openly and honestly. We see that he paid attention to the state of his soul. Didn't ignore it if things weren't right. He brought it to God in prayer. And that, I think, is a person with formidable spirituality. And I was struck in my preparations this week for what the psalmist writes here and what some Christians who are very well remembered by history have gone through in struggles with things like depression and despair. So Martin Luther was the German uh, priest and monk who helped launch the Protestant Reformation. 
And he battled emotional and spiritual darkness at different times that was so severe he nearly died. And especially during his awful experiences uh, ministering through times of plague, through the Black Death. And in one letter he wrote, I spent more than a week in death and hell. My entire body was in pain and I still tremble. Completely abandoned by Christ, I labored under the vacillations and storms of desperation and blasphemy against God. But through the prayers of the saints, his friends, God began to have mercy on me and pulled my soul from the inferno below. And Luther advised that people not just endure times of doubt or the devil's assaults, but to thank God, he says, thank God diligently for deeming him worthy of such a visitation. Do not be worried, he insisted. Indeed, such a trial is the very best sign of God's grace and love for a man. His advice was at such a time it is well to pray, read, or sing. That's so simple, isn't it? Pray, read, or sing. To fill your heart by spending time with the scriptures, by seeking God in prayer through, the, through music. Luther had a passion for music. He highly valued the Psalms. He often turned his reflections on them into congregational songs. Sometimes he took bar tunes and he rewrote them into Christian music so people would sing them everywhere that uh, they picked up that tune in their minds. So let's be honest with God and ourselves for a couple minutes here and consider our spirituality these past 18 months. How have you been filling your heart? So when church services and programs weren't available, quite a few Christians filled their hearts with fearful news and online conspiracy theories and particularly petty politics, and the results have not been pretty. Other Christians, though, refocused on their personal spirituality. I saw a survey showing that there was you know, a minority, but a sizable minority of Christians who said that prayer had become a greater focus in their lives, that they were spending more time with their Bibles through the pandemic and the lockdowns and all these things. What direction did your pandemic experience move you? And were you able to keep filling your heart with things that brought joy and hope and desire for God, or did you end up allowing in things that perhaps were not so good? Because we're always filling our hearts. If you stop choosing one thing, another thing will work its way in. And sometimes that thing may be fairly neutral. You know, if it's not keeping you from good, at least. The pandemic was very good for online movie and streaming services. But other times, the thing that works its way in is poisonous, right? The pandemic was also very, very good for the online porn industry. The spread of misinformation by careless and foolish social media users has been deadly. Now, every person has thirsts and longings. Ronald Rollheiser again writes that spirituality is ultimately about what we do with that desire. What do we do with our longings, both in terms of handling the pain and the hope that they bring us, that is our spirituality. So what would it look like for you to recover spiritually as we emerge from this pandemic? How will you choose to fill your heart so that it overflows with good, so that that's what comes out of you? When I thought back to my pandemic experience so far, I was trying to think of the few helpful things that I stumbled onto that were spiritually positive. Not to say that it was pure positive, and I only learned good things and, and grew in good ways, but I wanted to focus on the positive. And I felt early in the, in the uh, pandemic, when we were in that first wave, when we were told to not go anywhere, there was a Christian meditation podcast that was so helpful to me in my restlessness and my fatigue. And it often put me to sleep before the session was even done. But, you know, rest is a spiritual discipline, too. So you can remember that. It might come in handy after you've had enough turkey and, you know, you can't stay awake any longer. Podcasts were a very good thing for me under my circumstances lately because you can do them while you're trying to keep up with the laundry and the dishes and the soap making and even the lawn mowing because I have an electric mower now so you can hear what's going on. Because my world had shrunk. <laughs> and so, you know, these, my podcasts and my phone kept me connected to preaching, to discussions about racial justice, to Christian marriage and biblical interpretation and all kinds of other things. And so I think teaching from faithful and knowledgeable people is a good thing to fill our hearts with. And in line with Martin Luther, it was almost surprising to me that music became more important to me than normal. 
So I'm not a person who normally, I like music, but I don't often care about it that much or think to put it on. I don't play it in the house when I'm there by myself. It's not usually what I'm listening to in my earbuds. But early in the pandemic, I felt so drawn to, to hymns to help my downcast soul. Right now, I'm benefiting from these compositions from the Psalms by a Canadian artist, someone I highlighted in my overflow post last week when I do my weekly articles based on the, the sermon content. And so I'd ask, what was life-giving when life was disrupted? And what, you know, were there any things that you need to seize on and keep going with? And what will you choose to fill your heart with in the season to come? Will it be corporate, like gathered worship with an attitude more like the psalmist, with that greater expectancy and passion with God's people? Will it be personal? Will you subscribe to that Bible reading plan, that email devotional, that music that blesses your soul? A preaching podcast, will you carve out those moments of quiet to check on your soul and offer prayer? Because the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. If your mouth is full of anxiety and anger or fear or despair lately, well, then that has to do with what the heart has been being filled with. So what have you been choosing to put in there? What has you been allowing to find its way in there? What people, what activities, what media have led you to that place? Now, if you are in a place of anxiety or anger or fear or despair, you can't always reach out, even anonymously to our prayer line, just so people will pray for you or to talk to me or one of our deacons or to ask for some help in finding a good counselor or therapist or someone if you need that. We will try to help you. We will make sure that works out for you if you want it. But sometimes the trouble in our souls is the absence of good things. It is not filling your heart with what you need spiritually. And if that's the case, then it's time to change that. There's no better day than now to decide to change that. It's time to recover your spirituality. Put your hope in God, for you will yet praise him, your Savior and your God. By day, the Lord directs his love for you. At night, his song is with you, a prayer to the God of your life. So rather than a closing prayer, I want to leave you with some music. Uh, this is part of a composition based on Psalm 42 from my current favorite playlist. And this song, I'm only going to play the second half because it's fairly long, so a few minutes I thought was enough. But it begins with the downcast soul. It begins with the question of why, God, have you forgotten me? But then I've taken the clip from the end as it transitions to trust and to praise. And so I encourage you to, to listen, to meditate on that. And remember the lines from today's psalm, that by day the Lord directs his love, at night his song is with me. So will I yet praise you, my God and my Savior. The moment Lucy will play that behind us.
Amen. Invite our worship leaders to come and we will give praise on our hymn of commitment, which is When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. You're welcome to either stand or sit, depending on what feels comfortable and worshipful for you. Christ dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Amen. 